Canada, where the cold can kill and even frozen food is scarce. Whether you're fish or fowl or the biggest bovine on the block, in this game, time is always tight. So fight or get out of the way. They've got one thing on their mind, and that is sex. They are the size of dinner plates. So instead of a tug of war, there's a push of war. In this hostile environment, to win is to survive or die trying. Every day, everywhere, our planet is a battleground. Turf wars, food fights, and mating mayhem rage on as animals outwit and outmaneuver their own kind in Battle of the Alphas. Northern Alberta, in Wood Buffalo National Park, the winter blanket is gone. The bison bulls are deciding who gets to mate this season. Needless to say, they don't take a vote. When two evenly matched bison decide to go for it, it's an awe-inspiring sight. From five, six meters away, they will put their heads down and they will ram each other at full speed. The male bison has been evolutionarily designed to be big and aggressive. For bulls, that aggression starts early, which may explain why parents kick the boys out of the herd when they're teenagers. So sons leave, daughters stay in the social group, and they'll go off on their own. They're constantly tussling with one another and challenging each other and building their strength up. The young bachelors keep to themselves. That is until they have an overwhelming desire for the company of females. Let the rut begin. The females in estrus are looking for the ideal mate. But only the best bulls need apply. They're hard to miss. Two meters tall, four meters long, a thousand kilograms of muscle and testosterone. It's almost like two animals put in two. It's like the front half of a gorilla and the, the hind part is like a racehorse, so they can move incredibly fast. They're really agile. A top bull could mate with up to 50 females. His mission is to herd them under his control and away from the other bulls. And he will try to keep those females to himself so he can mate with each and every one of them. It's a bit more of a winner-takes-all scenario. But the young bulls are watching and waiting. It may be six, seven, eight plus years before they're finally big enough to not only challenge a rival, but big enough to win and, and keep a territory. Quite often, that male can only stay at the top of his game, be physically strong enough and dominant enough for maybe two seasons before he gets too old and peaks. It's all about opportunity. Is the old guy running out of gas? A young upcomer, a young pretender who's big and strong, who's been waiting on the sidelines, fancies his chance. The big males are like, this is the year you're gonna stand up to me, huh? And if he's big enough, and if he's strong enough, then he will have a chance. Now what happens is the ballet between these tough males, they do the sizing one another up. There's a whole series of rituals before they actually decide to suffer potential injury. They do a lot of parallel walking, so the opportunity to actually see the dimensions of the suitor that they're going to fight. They can wallow aggressively on the ground. They will urinate all over themselves. They'll be able to smell that testosterone. All these things communicate size. They communicate vigor. They communicate strength. They communicate combat experience. And if neither one backs down, that's when, finally, they will decide to come together. There's a metric ton of bison behind those charging craniums. The bison also have thick plates of skull, particularly around the eye or orbital region, when they come together in these monumental clashes. 
And that really helps them not only deliver a blow, but also receive one without causing undue damage to the animal's brain. So instead of a tug of war, there's a push of war. The key to winning a push of war is to put the head down and keep pushing. The advantage shifts from one bull to the other, and then back again, until one of them reveals a vulnerable flank. And if they can try and turn that male so its flanks are exposed, then it can push home its advantage and drive that head and drive those horns into the animal's flanks. And that's where real damage can be done. Horns can pierce hide and draw blood, but the real damage is reputational. The females are watching. And once they've won, they will kind of snort and they will bellow and they'll strut around and they will show the harem of females who's the boss. But winning a fight does not guarantee mating success. Females are not hapless victims in all this. If there's a male that's molesting her, that's bothering her the whole time, she will use an alpha male, the dominant male, to get him to go away. She'll signal. She'll start bellowing out, get the attention of her resident alpha male, saying, hey, this young one won't leave me alone. So the females will effectively choose who they want to mate with. They're not passive in this whole procedure. They choose these males as much as the males choose them. Which means sometimes the champ is a chump. That gives a beta male an opportunity to sneak in and give all the females a little attention. Any handsome beta had better be quick, because the big bull usually gets the last word. Over 2,000 kilometers west, in Canada's Yukon Territory. There are many words to describe this raptor. Iconic. Majestic. Pirate. The bald eagle is a picture of courage and strength and aggression. But in reality, it's a scavenger. He's watching all the time and then seizes the moment and uses its incredible eyesight, its massive size, its powerful talons, its speed to swoop in and steal the hard-won gains of other birds. If they are having a hard time, if it's a hard winter, then they will not think twice about chasing other birds like herons and ospreys or even being uh, otters to get them to dump what they've been eating so that they can then steal it. On this riverbank, a lone bald eagle is the bully by default. The gulls can only hope for scraps, but add some other bald eagles, and suddenly the bully has some real competition. In the winter, carrion is a major part of its actual food source. They are aggressive when it comes to guarding the carcasses they come across. But for all its power, the bald eagle faces a perilous existence. Although they have no animal predators, most eaglets will not survive beyond their first year. Their greatest threat is starvation. So where there's one frozen fish head and a dozen hungry eagles, there's going to be a fight. If they're fighting over a kill in winter when they've hardly had any food, then it can almost be a matter of life and death. The dust-up can be quite quick, because one eagle will try to take advantage of another eagle not seeing it and will fly in as quickly as possible and try and drive it off the kill. It'll fly in with those big talons and try and push it and drive it away. The bald eagle has some of the strongest footgear in the avian world. Now, the talons 
are basically three toes forward and one backwards called the halux. And on those toes, you've got incredibly impressive talons that are made of keratin that we have in our fingernails. Now, these are like two inches long, curved and incredibly sharp. But it's not just the talon that's important, it's the grip of these birds. But if I were to grip my fist as hard as I possibly could, the bald eagle could easily exert 10 times the amount of pressure that I can exert in my clenched fist. If two evenly matched eagles are fighting, they'll hold their wings out to be intimidating, put those talons forward, and then just fight talon to talon. They'll have a grappling match, and sometimes they can even roll and fight about if they really need that food. When push comes to shove, there is no substitute for experience. The biggest, baddest eagle waits for the young ones to exhaust themselves, and then he makes his move. And that's when being an old statesman, a wise bird who's been around the block before, that's when all that experience comes to bear, because they know when to go into attack. They can throw their weight around. They can subjugate and dominate all the other birds. An eagle that survives into adulthood can live another 20 to 30 years and they will be fighting all the way. The thing is with the bald eagle, it's not a regal eagle. <laughs> it's a bit of a bully. If you put it in human terms, if you're scrappling over a dinner table and then suddenly a big hulking person comes in with muscles and looks quite aggressive, skin head, nose pierced, grimacing, you're gonna think to yourself, it's yours. But in the Battle of the Alphas, who says life is fair? Baffin Island, Canada. 500 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. He is the largest of the bears, the apex predator of the Arctic a marvel of evolutionary adaptation. Whether he's on top of the freezing water or in it. They're considered to be marine mammals. They can swim up to 90 kilometers and can hold their breath for up to a minute underwater. And he has one of the most sensitive noses in the animal kingdom. So polar bears really have the most astonishing sense of smell. Their smell is the primary sense they use. Right now, he smells a female. Quite often, they'll only have one opportunity all season to mate with a female, and they will be following that female potentially, smelling her, smelling a female in estrus for possibly tens or even hundreds of miles. The female is close, and that's good. But the problem with an estrus female is that all the other male polar bears smell her too, and that's bad. The reason why most polar bears fight is down to sex. So when they get to find the female, if there's another male there, then there's going to be a fight. The polar bear's paws are more than boxing gloves. They are the size of dinner plates. And the pads on the paws themselves are incredibly rough, like sandpaper, to help that traction on the snow. He needs that traction as he swings those giant paws. And I've seen them, those massive claws for fighting and cutting open other polar bears. Their paws are big as my head. Fighting is a calorie-intense activity. And any bear that loses a fight over a female loses twice. He's not mating, 
and he's out of energy. More than anything now, he needs to eat. Arctic Survival 101, always be hunting. Because only a well-fed bear will have a chance at winning a battle. He uses that super sensitive nose to find the calorie rich food his body craves. They can smell when it sails about to surface. And that's when a long snout, a muscular neck is able to thrust forward and grab their prey. And with those astonishing canines and incisors, they make sure they don't lose that prey. To meet basic energy needs, an adult polar bear needs to eat an adult seal about every 10 days. And that's really important because every calorie counts when it comes to fighting. Finally, a square meal. 20 kilograms of seal blubber. Now he can concentrate on finding a mate. He sniffs out the trail of a female. She's not far off. But there's a problem. This female has two cubs. She's not in estrus. And the only way to bring her into estrus is for him to kill her cubs. Sometimes a stranger male will confront a female in order to kill her cubs so that he can then mate with her. The mother bear isn't about to let that happen. Female polar bears are smaller than males, but her maternal instinct gives her superpower. The lonesome stranger will have to look elsewhere for a mate. And if he finds her, one thing is certain, he'll have to fight. This male polar bear has crossed 100 kilometers of ice and ocean on his quest. He's been beaten. He's been half starved. But he'll have to dig deeper still, drawing on everything he's learned. From his first wrestling match with his brother, through sparring as a juvenile, His entire life has been leading to this moment. You see a fighter, a cage fighter in the octagon. And when he's fighting in the octagon, that's the end of, that's the battle for him. But also he spent hundreds and thousands of hours in the gym doing all that exercise. And that's what the polar bears are doing as well. They're practicing their techniques. They're fighting with their peers, their cohorts, to learn the art, when to push, when to bite. They're learning the techniques, the tricks of the trade. When a polar bear is in peak physical fitness, at its largest, at its most aggressive, at its strongest, it's ready to put all that practice, it's learned from the play fighting into action, and that's when it's gloves off. So on one hand, they're on the attack, but on the other hand, they're trying to defend against those big claws and those very large teeth. But they can cope with a huge amount of injuries and lots of wounds, and a blooded polar bear could still be the victor. You forget about the injuries, you forget about the damage because you have the ultimate prize. It's the right to mate with the female, and that's the biggest prize of all. At last, his fighting genes will live on. On the western side of the Rocky Mountains, in the headwaters of the Okanagan River, it's one of nature's most grueling journeys, and it's a one-way trip. For these sin, there's no going back. For some, there's no going forward either. It's known as anadromous, which means it spends part of its life, the beginning and end, in freshwater river systems, and the rest of its life, the middle years, out in the ocean, out in the Pacific, back to the rivers, back to fresh water, 400 miles upstream to try and get back to the very same place where they themselves hatched out from the egg. 
They have to fight their way up the river systems, past predators and dams and blocks and waterfalls they have to leap up. They've got one thing on their mind, and that is sex. After they fought the current and dodged the bears, the salmon faced their final nemesis, each other. They have to return back to the river systems, the zenith of their life, and fight to pass on their genes to the next generation. That's when they have to go this radical transformation. They change their color radically from the marine system to the freshwater system. As their skin thickens, it absorbs those shiny scales, and now instead, rather than being reflective, displays the flesh underneath, which is bright pink. They change their jaw shape completely. The top of their nose gets much more bulbous and elongated, and their teeth are almost like canine. By the time the salmon has reached its spawning ground, the fish is a shell of its former self. They're no longer feeding. Their stomach starts to just disintegrate inside their bodies as they become these moving muscular sacs of essentially gonads, because that's all that matters now, is to get upriver, get to the place where they themselves spawn, and then spawn again. Whether it's male or female, whether sockeye, chinook, or cutthroat, all seven species of Pacific salmon are pure reproductive determination. When the females get to the spawning beds, they're looking for the biggest, brightest, healthiest males in the best part of the stream. They have one chance to pass on their genes. Obviously, she wants the genes of the males who've been incredibly successful, who are big and bulky. The females will mate with the males that command the best spots on the riverbed, so every male does what it must to get that spot. By the time they finally make it to the area where they're going to meet the females and fight for the right to pass on their genes, that's where the battle begins. When salmon tussle, they really do go for it. They will throw their weight around. They will grip and grab the competitor, throw them around, bite them, thrash at them. When male salmon fight, it can be seriously brutal. Eventually, one is subjugated, one is beaten up, and one moves downstream as the alpha male take the prize of the females waiting to mate. If you're not the king of the stream, there's still a chance for you. You can become what's known as a satellite male. They're waiting for that dominant male to just run out of puff, and then they can rapidly take his place. The satellite must act quickly. He must anticipate where the female will lay her eggs and spray his fertilizing sperm in advance. The astonishing thing is they can be surprisingly successful. Then suddenly, the frenzy is over. The adults in their droves just die off. It looks like the end of some kind of war film. It's the end of the battle, the end of the road for the salmon as they're lying dead on the aquatic battlefield. The battle of the alphas of different species are competing for their dead, decomposing bodies because hopefully the protein, the food that is the dead salmon will go on to help all this array of predators see through those long, cold winter nights. So it's a fantastic end that this huge wave of death can spark such a massive bloom of life. Canada, where the days are short and the distances are long. A place where an icon can be knocked off his perch and the end of one journey 
can start another.